Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much to take the time to be here. It's a user, it's a user case session, uh, and during the next 30 minutes, we will tell more about how we handle uh, the API gateway deployment at OneFootball and some decisions that you made during the process. Uh, thank you very much for to be here. We are really happy. Our main focus today is not to create a uh, how-to or to bring you extensive technical details. It's more related with how even with a high traffic environment and a small S3 team, uh, we were able to deploy Ambassador and bring some money reduction uh, money safe to our company, reduce operational workload, and deliver new API gate features to our services. Um, so my name is Rodrigo Del Monte. I'm working with as system administrator for more than 10 years with AWS and working with Kubernetes for two years. My name is Jonathan Beber. I'm SRE at One Football. I uh, have been working for the last six years with AWS and uh, cloud and containers environments. And I didn't have anything else to put here, so that's my Twitter if you want to follow me and know more. Uh, we at OneFootball, we have the mission to tell the world uh, football stars. Uh, OneFootball was founded on 2018. And now we have more than 10 million active users, monthly active users. Uh, we are the world biggest uh, mobile football platform. And that's basically we aggregate content, create its content, its stats, and tell the stories that football is right. Uh, we have more than 180 employees now. And we believe we can change the way that fans consume football, so we think that we can reach them everywhere and anytime. Uh, so if you're a football fan, uh, give a try to the app, and if you want to take a look on our careers page, we are hiring, and you are located in the Berlin city. Uh, now we'll just give a quick overview of our environment to make more sense for you when we start talking about the migration. So we run an EC2 instance and Kubernetes over EC2 instance. We are running today over COPS, but we are also trying AKS. Uh, we have more than 50 microservices today in production. It's a small engineering team, around 30 to 40 engineers. And we have applications writing mainly in Golang, and, but we also have applications in PHP, Node.js, Python, among other languages. And we are a media company, so mainly our traffic are images and static content. So we use a CDN solution to help us to handle and did not receive more hits that we already received. And now we are using uh, Ambassador as API gateway and Ingress solution. Uh, some part of our content uh, is also cached in our site, so we are heavy user of Reds on the last cache, and the kind of traffic it's like sometimes spike. We have some huge spikes. For example, the last Cristiano Ronaldo uh, transfer to Juventus generated a huge spike there. So we can't cache everything. So for that, we use Aurora to also scale our Ridge replicas. And we will start providing some contents about where we were uh, bef uh, by the end of the World Cup 2018. Uh, we had a quiet World Cup from the engineering perspective. Uh, maybe uh, German and Brazilian national team didn't have the same luck, but we had. <laughs> So three months before the World Cup, we start to migrate everything from more than 350 C2 instance, uh, a lot of ELBs, HR proxies, Nagios, to the lovely Kubernetes world, and supported by Helm, Prometheus, and this cloud-native environment. Uh, Fred Winnick is our uh, team leader at OneFootball and told a little bit about this, this process in the last AWS summit. 
So you can search for how one football won the World Cup to have more details. But our mission at that time was to keep everything as simple as possible. And we also wanted to say thank you to the company and especially to the product team that on that time uh, freezed all the software delivery, software features, just to prioritize, uh, to focusing on stability and performance. So that was where we were at that time. And of course, we were happy about our results, but we had to move forward. And uh, when we were migrating to the Kubernetes, we, we decided to not change too much, uh, using the rule first make it work, then make it right, then make it fast. And at that time, we had, for example, one ELB per service. We had like 40 services running. Uh, and also for logging, uh, RedMQ clusters, and some HA procs as well. And we were surrounded by all these ELB, CDN configurations, and DNS entries, and that did not our lives easy. So, and the business team was pushing forward, like we had the freezing, so now it was time to again start delivering new features. And with new features were coming up new services. For every new service, we had a new LB, a new CDN config, if it was a user-facing service. We had uh, overhead of monitoring, because every new server was not centralized. We have to take care where this, how this traffic is coming to the service, and how we would monitor it. And so, for example, in CDNs, in ELBs, if we have to change our SSL certificate, the TOS certificate, we have to change on CDN and now of this bunch of ELBs. Uh, of course, we don't change SSL certificates in a monthly basis, but it's just one example of an error-prone and uh, boring task that we had at that time. So as a small SRE team, uh, one of our requirements was to find some simple solution. Uh, we previously tried some other uh, solutions that required some state database config, which could uh, add some overhead to the team. And Ambassador uh, keeps everything inside Kubernetes, taking advantage of the annotations inside the service object. And that for us, for us, was a killer feature. Uh, so basically, we are already using Helm to manage our deployments. And when we deployed Ambassador, we were just deploying one more application in production. So at first, we intend to use Ambassador just as an ingress solution. So, and you, you probably know that we had another ingress solutions at uh, Kubernetes, but. The difference is once we needed API gate features and API gate capabilities, Ambassador was there, red shoes, and really, really easy. Uh, under the hoods, uh, Ambassador used Envoy. There is a well-known and stable solution. And what it facilitates us to integrate with another service mesh solutions that also use Envoy. Uh, for example, Istio, that one thing that we are trying now. But and also apply different envoy filters, or, and the performance is always the same that uh, envoy would provide for us, because um, Ambassador just uh, generate configs and pass it to envoy. All the traffic go just through envoy. So for us, Ambassador proved itself to be a open source Kubernetes native API gateway, as that our says. And you might be asking yourself, why not use uh, just the Kubernetes ingress, but Ambassador is more than a HTTP router. We used to say that it has some batteries included. For example, uh, we use the traffic shadow, so we are delivering new machine learning uh, service in production, and we use this traffic shadow to test the service. We, we will provide more details in the for their slides, we also use halting based uh, on headers. So basically, we use these headers to make some tests in production. Uh, 
so real users are not affected by these tests, and also uh, how to base it on path, so we can have some kind of manual canary release it using these paths. So we had the, uh, the API gate solution defined, and then we had to start thinking about how to migrate everything. At that time, we had just around 40 microservices, and, but it was production in staging, so it was more than 80 migrations to plan and apply, and it was a small team, so we had this, this challenge up front. So, so and that time was not an option for us as we were receiving production traffic. So basically the DNS setup was completely manual uh, in our side and uh, it was hard to maintain. And a dumb mistakes that sometimes happen, uh, for example, could fail. And for, for, for example, we, can, we maybe could create a new service and forgot to point the the, to the right in the DNS side to the right serves. Of course, it's possible to automate, but it's a uh, human error prone. We always use the Helm to deploy our application, so each application inside its own repository had a Kubernetes path. And it was nice because it kept the, the, it, uh, kept the application code really near to its, uh, to the, its configurations, but at the same time, it was hard for us to tracing change across 40 different repositories. So for sure, it didn't help in our productivity. So the SR team is not actually a SR team. It's more than a competency area uh, across multiple cross-functional teams in, at one football. And sometimes projects like that can get lost. So we will have a project across multiple teams. So we, will have, we didn't have any team leader or product manager pushing it to, be, to production. And since we had multiple load balance, we start to feel struggled, like with too many points of configuration. And even our access logs of the load balancer were spread across multiple load balancers. We could like centralize everything on, a, on just one bucket, all these logs, but it was not easily integrated with our log, centralized log solution. So, and it was the same with other configs, like uh, timeouts or SSL configs or health check endpoints. It was hard to uh, find what was being applied to each application. And another problem that we had uh, before Ambassador was we used COPS to manage our uh, Kubernetes cluster, which had a known limitation of 15 uh, public load balancers, because uh, you can just attach 15 security groups to a single S2 node. Uh, it was a added fix by the cops when they introduced the shared security groups, but uh, at the time our Kubernetes version, it was not supported and it will, would be a, one more change to you know, upgrade the, the Kubernetes version. So the first thing that we came up was to create our own Helm Shard repository. It was really important for us because the team could focus, the SRE competency area could focus in just one Git repository. And we start to create an important separation between the applications code version and the applications configuration version. So with these two important artifacts that start to be generated, the code application itself, so it, uh, the applications code itself, so it was a Docker image artifact with all the dependencies, and a Helm chart, uh, version artifact as well. So we had this difference between uh, what is my application code version and what is my Helm chart version, and we could trace uh, difference and uh, which application, uh, which application configurations apply to each application version. So uh, the Helm chart repository that we created, it's as simple as possible, all the Helm configurations that live inside the application was moved to the centralized repository and introduced some simple version. Uh, 
in this Helm chart, like a, a semantic version. And each time that a new commit is merged to the branch master, uh, all the changed chart is built and pushed to the Helm repository. And when the application is built and deployed, also our CD solution applies the last Helm chart version to each application. So with this, more than we be able to trace it easily, we could uh, change more than one application and add the ambassador config to more than one application per pull request, even all of them if you want it. And uh, again, keep tracing of that very easily, which application is using ambassador or not. And now all the configuration about the load balancer, it's centralized in just one Kubernetes service, the ambassador, and we have it to run it. Now it was time to, it was necessary to create all the applications mappings for each service. And one ambassador works like a envoy control plane and it tries to simplify invoice configuration. So to create uh, these maps, I will need to create it's a annotation inside the Kubernetes ser service, for example. The, this image represents uh, ambassador definition, so we, we have the kind mapping with the host and point to the service that we use the shared name as a service. Now it's a little bit outdated because uh, that's why I just released the CRDs. <laughs> but yes, and here you you can focus on the host, the first host configuration. Uh, it's a regular expression. We, you can use regular expressions or not. We, we, mainly our service receive, uh, answer a lot of names, so we use the regex in mainly all the services. But what we're saying is, if one request comes to ambassador and matches this host regex, the traffic will be sent to the, this service. And of, it's not mandatory to send to the same service where the annotation is, but in this case, it would, would go to the same service because we are using the shard name, dot shard name model of uh, name mean to our services. And when we are going to production, we are confident, but uh, not enough to switch the DNS announce and even for non-critical service, so the, the old but gold technique that we use in our team is to, when we are migrations, migrating some service, is to use the HALT 53 waves. So, and it works, uh, it worked at pre well for this case, so our migration process was like that. We first deployed the ambassador mapping, then we just testing the mapping, checking and rule or redirecting like this regex uh, to the host, and it's a simple curve can test it, and then we start to uh, increase the traffic in the Hot 53 wave. So we start with one percent or ten percent, depend of the in the beginning, depending of the service, and start to monitor it, gain more confidence until we increase into the 100 percent of the traffic to ambassador. And. Following these steps, we were gaining confidence on Ambassador and on its metrics as well. And we were able to deploy multiple critical applications at the same time. But we ever used this, this format because it was important to us not to us have confidence on Ambassador, but also for the other software engineers and the engineering leaders. And a gradual and transparent migration like that avoided us endless meetings and syncs between teams and uh, uh, this kind of process that it's not so easy when you have to sync between a lot of people. Uh, when the migration was done, we removed all the old load balancers from Amazon and just with that we, we saved more than 20,000 uh, dollars per year, so it was not so much, but in the end, it also removed complexity in our DNS configuration, and since applications now pointed to the, always to the same address, to the load balancer that was responsible for ambassador. And another thing that we did at the same time, we also create a new domain, that's api.moonfootball.com, 
uh, it's this second map, so you can have more than one map in, in your configuration. So basically, this mapping, what to do, it's okay. Everything that's api.onefootball.com uh, slash the chart name or the service name, please send to the specific service. And at the same time, we could keep the compatibility with the old clients that use the old URL, uh, for example, service.onefootball.com. So since we started using Ambassador, as I told you, we could focus in just one point of configuration. But more than that, Ambassador Pod was integrated with our, our solutions for our applications. So the same pipeline that deliver our applications, the, the same scrapper metric solution that we use for our applications, the same, uh, met, uh, the same CD pipeline was the same that we are using for our API gated solution. So it was tackles directly our mission of keep things as simple, uh, keep, keep things as simple as possible. And even to upgrade ambassadors was as easy as uh, code change in our own code base. So it was very simple. And uh, before ambassador, we had some. Uh, lack of metrics when you talk about the load balancer. Uh, all the throughput was measured in a white box using the APM2. And of course, there was a way to, to collect these metrics, for example, from CloudWatch and generate some reports automatically. But first, it was not done. Second, we we imported this, we could import these metrics to existing solution or would have a third place to store this solution. So, and Envoy uh, delivers good metrics uh, about the internals and Ambassador helps, help, Ambassador helps to expose these metrics uh, using the StatsD protocol. Uh, the first image here is just an example of the documentation, how it is connected and works. So it was pretty much the same thing for us. We just have like every envoy, uh, every ambassador pod has the envoy pod as, uh, envoy as well, and it has a side container that was a StatsD exporter. This StatsD exporter project is responsible for converting StatsD metrics format to Prometheus format. So if we have the Prometheus operator, we define a service, man, service monitor, and the service monitor is responsible to collect all this data for all these ambassador pods. Uh, we use a external Prometheus to have uh, better visibility of our persistence, and uh, so we just define a federation job on this external Prometheus that is in, outside the cluster and it collects the data from the inside Prometheus that is responsible for collecting ambassador data. It was really nice for us because we had more insights now and we could, could easily generate metrics that was not white box. So for example, for our SLOs, we can use the, these metrics that come from ambassador from a load balancer level, not from a white box level. Uh, so we could have insights like uh, success, fails, how many requests uh, are failing on the client side or how many requests are failing on the server side. Oops. Yep. <laughs> As you said before, we provide code for more than 10 million uh, users around the world in 13 different languages. And you know, for sure, we have all these test suite that you might know, like unit test, integration, integration tests, UI tests, and so on. But sometimes it's difficult to avoid some odd behaviors in production. Uh, so that's why we, 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 we try we, we, yeah, we try to to avoid it because uh, yeah, for operations the feature is just test on it's in production. So the train is just a train, and, and the game is is the game, right? So and we trying to avoid this bad experience for the users, 
we try to create controlled explosions. So for example, releasing software per language, uh, new features per language, or with increasing percentage of the traffic. So it's basically a canary deploy. So the problem was, before Ambassador, we were creating this uh, canary release uh, logic on the application code level, or we were trying to create it on the CDN level, and it was hard to maintain, error prone, and uh, the, the worst part was uh, hard to hold back. And then comes Ambassador if the battery is included. And if uh, some fails in this release, we can quickly hold back the Helm Shard version and restart everything. Here is two examples of uh, kinds of release that we do. So the first one is the shadowy. So uh, we have, uh, in order to target the content to the right audience, we have to tag this content. Uh, and we are improved. The service use some machine learning magic to do, but we don't want to uh, switch everything at all. So we, here we are capturing some traffic from the HT extractor service with the old service and replay it on the machine learning service to take some metrics and be more confident to release it. The second example here, we have like two, two services. And this new API green just received an important software feature. It was changing a feature that was really important for us and user facing. So what we did, if you see in the prefix in the first one, we tag just the NL and RU. So it's the Dutch language and the Russian language. So we can deliver this, this feature just to these two languages. And it was really important for the product team and as well the engineering team got some insight and some feedback before releasing it or promoting this feature to all the 13 languages that we work with. So that's where we are today with Ambassador. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, oops. <laughs> we have a lot of work to do, yeah. But we want to talk with you a little bit about what we see being our next steps with Ambassador now. So the first thing Ambassador served us as an ingress solution, but more than that, they brought us something that we were not looking for at that time, but now we know the power. So we want to have the same capabilities now of tracing, of uh, canary release, of uh, uh, increased uh, centralized solutions and declarative solutions to our cluster inside to the traffic inside our cluster. So the, everything that is inside the cluster have to have the same capabilities. And today our TLS just being terminated by the load balancer. And one of our concerns, of course, the mutual TLS between applications. Uh, it's important to have the traffic secured and features like secret breaking and to increase the reliability of your service. And, Another point uh, of the observability that Ambassador Awed help us is the, it brings the metrics and the proper logs, but we still missing some distributed tracing solution. So Ambassador for us is really the north to south traffic goalkeeper. So all the traffic that is coming, uh, that is enters our cluster is passing through Ambassador. It's great for us and we have a, a native way to handle this traffic, but inside the cluster we have the uh, west to east traffic. So we are looking for east to. And uh, yeah, as a part of the engineer roadmap, we are going, we opt to start to use in, uh, to test east to do, because east to is also using Envoy under the hood, and it has a good integration with Ambassador, so we are able to have this uh, distributed trace, Moto TLS, retries, and so on. And Istio can be used as well as an ingress solution, but the time that we were evaluating this solution, we opt to go uh, with Ambassador, do it the simplest to get something wet in production and delivering value. 
So Ambassador, for example, integrates with Fistio very well because, one, it allows us to define TLS context for each application, for each mapping. So we just have to map the Istio certificates, and then the mutual TLS will start working. Ambassador have the stats D that we told you about, and so we have easily goes to Istio uh, Prometheus and says, please grab this data, scrap this data from Ambassador stats D exporter uh, con uh, side container. And yeah, that's just one thing, and we have also the and the, yeah, Ambassador integrates pretty well with Zipkin API. Take advantage of the invite trace capabilities. It uh, generates the, the headers to be used across the, the applications uh, to, the, the, to different applications, and it allows to define a tracing service. So you can send it to external service like Zipkin, Dragger, or Lightstep, who will receive all these. Uh, information and save to it. Yes, we have an example here with some tests that we did and for example to set a distributed tracing service is just a few lines of code. In this example, for example, uh, Ambassador will start sending out the distributed tracing details to this example zipkin on the port 9411 and with just one tracing service manifest, all the requests will start to being reported. So it's pretty easy. And that's all we have to say for now. Uh, again, thank you very much for attending the session. Uh, we hope that it was useful for you. And also, we want to thank you all the engineering team that helped us to deploy in this, in, with, in this project and to the talk preparation. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Anyone have questions? Hi. So uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, you don't use uh, the termination of um, TLS in Ambassador. How do you do it now? We terminate the TLS on our load balancer, on Elastic Load Balancer on Amazon. Okay. Yes. And then we pass the in plain test to Ambassador. Okay. So. More questions? So thank you very much. You're going to be here if you want to talk with us as well. Thank you. <laughs>